start by reading a quotation that's not in my book, but that I think is probably a good place to begin. In an effort to encourage his people to take up arms against an occupying army, an orator commented on a massacre that had occurred four years earlier. Of it, he said, that the still unpunished killers had sat religiously, polluted our land with the dead bodies of her guiltless sons. Let this sad tale of death never be told without a tear. Let not the heaving bosom cease to burn with a manly indignation at the barbarous story. Through the long tracks of future time, let every parent tell the shameful story to his listening children until tears of pity glisten in their eyes and boiling passion shake their tender brains. To explain why the community had not retaliated with force already, he insisted that it wasn't fear. For it is, he said, immortality to sacrifice ourselves for the salvation of our country. We fear not death. Our hearts, which at the recollection glow with rage that four revolving years have scarcely taught us to restrain, can witness that we fear not death. And happy it is for those who dare to insult us that their naked bones are not now piled up an everlasting monument. So does anyone here have a guess as to what the massacre was or, or what event is being commemorated in this speech? American historians? <laughs> uh, okay, well maybe this will help. He continued, do not the injured shades of Maverick, Gray, Caldwell, Addicts, and Carr attend you in your solitary walks arrest you even in the midst of your debaucheries and fill your dreams with terror. Uh, I decided to start with John Hancock's oration from the fourth anniversary of the Boston Massacre because political martyrdom, when we talk about it now, is often done in the context of the Middle East. Uh, we hear about 72 virgins, we hear about the cult of martyrdom in Islam, but political martyrdom is something that just about every modern nation shares in its foundation story in the United States uh, right along with the others. Uh, in fact, the Boston Massacre anniversary was the American national holiday until a few years after the American um, Revolution had ended, uh, and the 4th of July was chosen as the new one. So there was uh, this idea of commemorating uh, you know, heroic national deaths is at the heart of, of American nationalism as well. Um, and the source of this whole project, Men Mocked and Law, actually started with that question about political martyrdom. What is it about? How does it work? Why do movements do it? And particularly, the role that that martyrdom played in the American left. Uh, and as I was working on it, the cases that I chose kind of caused me to change what I was looking at a little bit. They kind of refocused. You know, as I read the more, I kind of realized there was something else going on. But just um, to give you an idea, the cases I covered uh, when I started the dissertation uh, that then became this book, John Brown, uh, which is the first chapter, uh, The Haymarket uh, Martyrs of Chicago from 1887, Joe Hill, Sacco and Vanzetti, The Rosenbergs, um, Huey Newton, George Jackson, the, um, and also uh, the Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner uh, deaths in Mississippi in 1964. Uh, and that chapter I actually wound up taking out when I went from the dissertation to the book because I decided that civil rights um, movement martyrdom had such a massive um, you know, national significance that there was no way to really include it in, in the book, but that it informed a lot of, a lot of my analysis. And, and what uh, the most important thing about doing the research on SNCC and the civil rights movement in the 60s was, and I did this as a seminar paper and a graduate course, because I had already kind of figured out the dissertation topic early on, uh, was that when I was looking at political martyrdom, I had to include the whole history of uh, lynching and anti-lynching activism in my study. Uh, and I realized while I was uh, doing the project that there's kind of two uh, histories of, of these kinds of people, and they don't, they don't speak to each other at all. There's a history of political trials, uh, of labor defense uh, to some extent, uh, you know, the famous big trials like the Rosenbergs and, and Scottsboro. And those are all kind of um, studied and there's books about them. And then there's a whole history of, of anti-lynching activism and lynching and that those two types of activism, even when they were done by the same groups, are, have never been compared, have never been uh, really analyzed in context. Uh, and so that was what kind of happened after I did the Cheney Goodman-Schwerner paper. And, um, 
And just in terms of thinking about, you know, your own projects, if you're a student or, you know, actually I was discouraged by the, the administration of my own graduate department from doing the comparative analysis between anti-lynching and labor defense because they were like, oh, it's apples and oranges, that's crazy, it's too much, you shouldn't do it. And I just sort of steadfastly stuck with it and I wouldn't have a book now if I had, if I had listened to, to that particular professor who taught the dissertation seminar in my field and, you know, I had to spend every week being used for my bad choices. So, uh, but anyway, just to give you like a little uh, history of the origins of the thing. Uh, but, so what I, what I decided when I came to, you know, initially I was like thinking of, in terms of martyrdom and I realized that these campaigns, whether they were anti-lynching activism or whether they were uh, labor defense for, you know, defense of, of for political activist support, that they were actually the exact opposite of promoting martyrdom. Because what martyrdom does, if you look at, you know, nationalist rhetoric of, of the unknown soldier or these, you know, national martyrs, is it doesn't really try to stop people from dying. But if you stop everything your movement is doing, or even take time away from what your movement is doing on other fronts to defend individual members of your movement, you're actually trying to prevent martyrdom. Right? And in all these cases, whether it was a collective uh, attempt to recover lynching victims, to stop lynching uh, and remember them and to sort of humanize people, which is what anti-lynching activism, a great deal of that was about, or whether it's about actually trying to stop the process of illegal uh, execution, it's not say, it's saying you know, self-sacrifice isn't a good idea. We don't want to be self-sacrificing. We don't want to die. We don't want to lose our members and keep focusing on you know, the main cause, which should be our strife or our you know, revolutionary political agenda. So there's actually an attempt in these to keep uh, martyrdom from happening. And so I make the argument in the book that this is a fundamentally um, democratic impulse that values individuals and social movements that on both sides, in black nationalist politics and in labor uh, and socialist politics, have been accused of being communal to the point of ignoring individual uh, rights or uh, individuality. And that saying that the movement needs to, to, you know, to actually pay attention to individuals and that should, people should engage on that basis is a, is a challenge to this idea. Uh, this kind of, it's a, really a stereotype of, and a critique of the left. It's always being brought up, you know, you all just want to be martyrs. The same is said in African American politics all the time, right? You just blame your victims all the time, right? So I found that that's totally not true and that these cases are a good kind of evidence against that. Um, what they do do at their most radical campaigns to, uh, these campaigns to defend political activists or um, try to stop lynching is they actually do, after people are killed and their then memorial organizing has to happen, they create a revolutionary counter history of the United States, just like John Hancock created a revolutionary history of the British power in the American colonies. They say that the United States is a source of terror, uh, not democracy, that it is the United States government is a murderer, uh, that, uh, and the most radical anti-lynching campaigns uh, make this argument as well, although they are often, you know, the word lynching refers to illegal violence, right? Mass, extra-legal violence. But people like Ida B. Wells, like W.E.B. Du Bois, the primary um, anti-lynching activists of the early uh, anti-lynching campaigns, connected police violence with mob violence. Uh, and they developed, and particularly Wells developed, what I refer to in the book as the police, uh, the mob law continuum, where the mob is is in cahoots with the with the legal uh, powers, and therefore that actually lynching is seen as a state uh, sort of a state action. So both of these campaigns say that the state is a villain, a criminal, uh, and that the stories from these campaigns themselves are the basis for encouraging revolutionary action. Uh, and that, in that way, that's why I would say they're very, you know, look at John Hancock with the Boston Massacre, it's the same dynamic. And you'll see it, you know, in other societies, right, in other revolutionary societies, actually the opening um, quotation from, in the book is from Franz Fanon about how people tell the stories of political martyrs the day before they're about to engage in revolutionary politics in Algeria. So this is, this is not something unique to Islam or, or you know, sort of foreigners, this is part of modern nationalism. 
Um, there's another uh, way, though, that American nationalism is unique, and it does have to do with why I had to look at both anti-lynching and labor defense organizing. And that is that, well, you know, the most famous quotation about uh, violence in the state, or you could say in social science, right, the vapor idea that the state has the monopoly on legitimate violence uh, in modern nations, that actually in the United States that's not true. And that wasn't true in the 1700s or the 1800s because America as a frontier uh, society encouraged settler vigilantism against Native Americans from the very beginning. And that was seen as patriotic and extending the national boundaries, right? And that wasn't done in the name of the state. That was often done by, you know, settlers who just moved out. So the whole history of settler colonialism in the U.S. has made vigilantism a part of the national patriotic story. David Crockett, right, Daniel Boone, all these figures. Um, in, addition, in addition to that, rebellious violence against the state because of the revolutionary story has been upheld when it's done by white people, uh, not when done by black people. And that there's a particular way, uh, which I cannot go into really here, because it's sort of long and involved, but that, that actually American politics, if you look at the writings of Thomas Jefferson, uh, legitimate white group violence and, and sort of say black people are are like in a whole different category and that they don't fit into this. And so there's like a racial line between uh, violence, whereas in European political discourse, you see a whole critique of the mob, which is going after you know working class people in collective action. In the United States, you see a critique of, of the mob that has a racial uh, tint to it. And then if you look at other kinds of white collective action, it's kind of celebrated. And Jefferson's the most famous, right, with the quote about the branches of the tree of liberty and the being furnished you know, with the blood of patriots and tyrants after the Daniel Shays rebellion. So you have this whole history of kind of sanctioned vigilantism as part of American nationalism. So um, let me just see if I can explain it in the context of a particular case. The first thing that I deal with, uh, the first one of these cases I deal with in the book is John Brown, who uh, actually, today really fares very badly. If you read American history textbooks, they're very negative about Brown. He's crazy, he's this and that. But if you go back to the Civil War era and read about Brown in the antebellum period or in the immediately up to around the 1880s, Brown is celebrated as a kind of paragon of Puritan national identity, and he's like Oliver Cromwell of America, in a very positive sense, right? Very anti-Catholic positive sense, because Cromwell um, was this great you know, Puritan uh, hero. Uh, and Catholicism is so uh, central, and, or anti-Catholicism is so central to American nationalism in the 19th century. So Brown is like this great guy. He's seen as kind of like the pre-Lincoln, you know, almost, in, in a lot of writing about him in, in the 19th century. Um, and it's, I argue that that's, and it's not a surprise, uh, that that's because he's white. That's a big part of it. And he's traced to a really racial lineage. He's Anglo-Saxon. His parents came on the Mayflower. He was the parents from the Revolution, which all turns out not actually to be true, but that's kind of how he's promoted for a while as this kind of perfect example of American manly action on behalf of others, the downtrodden slaves. Uh, in contrast, uh, Nat Turner doesn't get that kind of treatment in the 19th century. Nat Turner is considered some kind of crazy maniac who's been trying to read the Bible, but he doesn't really understand it, and that's why he goes and does some crazy action. So it's okay to have uh, violence against slavery if it's done by a white person. Then it's heroic, then it's great, then it fits the national pattern. But if it's Nat Turner, then it's like out of control, it's wacky, it's, you know, it's wrong, it's, it's going to be savage, your babies are going to be killed. You get a whole different um, kind of vision of it. And the same is true in, in analyzing mass violence in this period. If you read um, descriptions of the draft riots, uh, I read, went, read all the New York newspaper descriptions of the 1863 draft riots, which were you know, attacks on black people by what mobs of white people in resistance to the draft. And the draft rioters, it's sort of like our population has gone astray. But you know, in some ways, they're justified because the draft was unfair. 
uh, and they've been stirred up by politicians. It's a really good description, but it's like our people have gone astray. And then in terms of prosecutions of draft rioters, uh, there's almost none. You know, there are almost no uh, actual convictions of anyone uh, participating in the draft riots. Uh, compare that to the treatment of people even mildly associated in Nat Turner's uh, rebellion in, in uh, Southampton. Uh, actually, there were newspaper articles trying to discourage random white people from running out into the street with their gun and just shooting every black person in sight. Uh, you know, people's heads were, uh, people were decapitated and heads were put on poles of, to mark, you know, various areas around the rebellion. It was brutal repression uh, after Nat Turner's rebellion. So, um, so in the first chapter, I kind of try to establish this racial divide between what's considered acceptable uh, violence um, and what's not. And, uh, and, and also, the other thing about Brown that's interesting in terms of the whole project and looking at the history of, of these defense campaigns is that he really wanted to be a national hero. He wanted to be seen as, uh, and his promoters did too, they really kind of used the whole rhetoric of, of the 4th of July and everything else in defending him. Uh, and particularly, as I said before, the, the Cromwell recovery and John Brown is our Cromwell. He's like this upstanding <coughs> Anglo-Saxon Puritan. Um, but Tr Brown didn't want people to defend him. People tried to say, like, let's get to do an escape plan. We're going to break you out of jail. We're going to take you out in the night. You know, These were people who were familiar with fugitive slave rescues, Underground Railroad. Uh, organizing, so you know, it seems like maybe difficult, but it's conceivable that they could have tried. You know, maybe they were all killed in trying to do it. But uh, you know, these were the plans, and Brown said, "No, no, no. You know, I, I'm ready to die for my beliefs." So he fits a model of what really this kind of national heroism is, where you self for self-sacrificing. Uh, starting in the 1880s uh, and moving into what I go into the second chapter, look at the Haymarket. Uh, I argue that they're the ones who broke that pattern. And the reason that they did, I'm, how am I doing for time? Um, I'm all right. I have like 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. okay. the, the Haymarket uh, people, you know, their slogan of the labor organization that they were members of, the Knights of Labor, was an injury to one is an injury to all. And when the uh, anarchists of Chicago the eight men were convicted and sentenced to death for uh, supposedly conspiring to throw a bomb at the police uh, at a demonstration. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the story, uh, there was no bomber who was ever identified. So this was a bizarre uh, and really illegal uh, kind of legal procedure to say that you were you were conspiring with somebody unknown uh, to to murder this police officer. And it happens to be the eight, you know, major labor newspaper writers and radicals in Chicago that are the ones who were convicted. Uh, but when they were convicted, the movement that they came from organized a mass defense project. Uh, the wives uh, and friends of the, uh, the convicted men were first Lucy Parsons, who was one of the most you know, significant ones, went around. Uh, they stood on street corners and handed out literature. They, uh, Lucy Parsons went on a tour nationally and spoke to all the different um, Knights of Labor assemblies that she could. Uh, they did a massive campaign to save the lives of these men. And they argued um, in the process for a whole different concept of what heroism was about. And that this was the hero for the Haymarket anarchists and, and the movement that tried to save them was the mob itself. Right? If the mob is seen as negative and bad in, in the, when it's, you know, when it's, when it's black or a slave rebellion or it's the antithesis of good, you know, individualist heroes. And they say, mob is great. We, we are the mob. We're passionate. We're going to, you know, turn over your institutions and destroy uh, everything in our wake. Uh, the police and the state are represented as bad because they're cold, they're indifferent, they're thuggish. They're, uh, you know, the killing with the cold law or the police, you know, clubbing mothers and children over the head uh, in, you know, various demonstrations. So they reverse the whole notion of, of heroism uh, at the same time that they're also drawing on some of the kind of Jeffersonian stuff about, you know, white men in action, right? So they're able to pull on that, that tradition in American politics. They and other white socialists throughout the book that I, you see they can all sort of say, well, look at uh, 
look at the history of the American Revolution, look at the masses in action. Uh, and black activists just don't have that available to them, but the socialists do. So I kind of explore that through a number of, of different cases as I, as I go through and look at the um, conflicts that it creates. I mean, in particular, let me just read you a couple of quotes uh, here and try to wrap up. Um, this, is a, this is a description from the funeral uh, of the Chicago anarchists in Chicago after they were killed. Uh, and the German socialist paper, the Arbiter Zeitung, uh, is describing the crowd and they're, they have marched down and the police have confronted them uh, and then they sang the Marseillaise, which was at that time the song of socialist revolution, and everyone shouted, hurrah, says the newspaper. As the police are standing there, the police were temporarily unmanned by the force of this crowd. The reporter says, the police stood there looking on in terror, faced with this huge crowd which expressed its sympathy with the murdered men in such a demonstrative manner. They didn't dare intervene. They stood there with horrified looks on their faces and watched as the procession reformed and set out once again. So this is the whole beginning of a whole socialist tradition which says the mob is what is the hero, the mob has power, the heroic thing to do is to have sympathy with other people. It's a very kind of, um, it's, a, it's a relational kind of notion of heroism and it's uh, embodied in the IWW slogan which um, comes in 20, 20 years later about when political prisoners are on trial and being defended, they'll say, we're in here for you, you're out there for us. So there's a dynamic between the prisoner or the executed person and the people outside. And neither one of them has the sole agency, right? The person on trial's agency is up to the minute that they're convicted to not betray the movement in order to be with, right? They can speak uh, you know, about their ideals politically and that's their heroic act because that's very risky, right, in that context if you're facing death. To actually say, I believe in revolution, I believe in this, you know, socialist goal, and therefore you're serving the whole movement. And then if they're convicted or before they're convicted, the movement's responsibility to them is to, to support them, to maintain them, to organize on their behalf, but never just to let them be a martyr, just let them die. Uh, and when, and that was difficult, right? It's difficult still, I think, in the left for people to, uh, to hold on to that because people think it's sort of like a waste of time and you get focused on the individual and they say it's a cult of personality uh, and all these things. But it actually is very practical. And, and the IWW, when they started organizing, built on this tradition that had been created in the gay market. And one prisoner actually wrote this from prison as a, as a letter to the IWW newspaper to try to explain, well, why is this serving the movement? Can the IWW appeal to a man by saying, we stand for the solidarity of labor everywhere, except when you are arrested? An injury to one is an injury to all, except when you are arrested and brought into court? Not very encouraging to a man willing and anxious to become active, right? So this is a kind of, you have to do this if you're gonna be engaged in a process like labor organizing, which puts you in a way of you know, vulnerable to legal uh, repression. All right, so let me just quickly say what anti-lynching activists do that's different and then I'll stop and people can have questions. Um, so while the, while the socialist movement is doing this and organizing and celebrating the mob, the anti-lynching activists are in a totally different uh, position, right? Because they're being victimized by mobs. And they cannot talk about the great, wonderful, you know, mob heroism because they, when they see mobs, they're being victimized. Uh, and in fact, their heroic discourse, uh, if you read Ida B. Wells, uh, she celebrates manly individualism in resistance to the frenzy and passion of hysterical people trying to, uh, to um, kill them. She doesn't, as some people would say, and as often as I said before, it's a critique uh, that I think is a, you know, from a canard to say that you know, black nationalism is all about promoting victimization and saying you're victim all the time. Uh, she doesn't promote victimization. She has to walk a really thin line and all the anti-lynching activists do because it's very difficult to represent black male heroism in a society which views uh, black male power as always savage, always negative, always irrational and crazy. You think of the Nat Turner example. So she, on the one hand, wants to portray uh, black men and show that there is real victimization, right? People who are uh, killed, um, who are weaker than the people that are attacking them. They don't have any legal protection. 
They don't have weapons. Uh, they're always described as super powerful and like savage beasts. So she's trying to fight that characterization. But she doesn't want to say, oh, people are total victims. Because she's trying to make an argument, ultimately, for black people having full citizenship. And to say that you're a victim, you can't be a hero. You can't act in your own name. Other people have to act for you. So she describes, uh, in one particular case that she's uh, organizing around, Robert Charles uh, in Louisiana was a nationalist, um, work, actually organizer for Henry McNeil Turner. And he was shot by police in New Orleans in 1900. And that ignited. He, he, they, he then shot back. And there was a chase and a, you know, all over New Orleans. And then they tried to go and, and um, kill him. But they killed lots and lots of other people in New Orleans. And it was a big race riot. So she, she doesn't talk about, oh, you know, well, he went too far, or Robert Charles is bad. She says, well, Robert Ch Chase, uh, sorry, Robert Charles was showed manliness. He had deadly aim. He stands in front of a mob of police shooting at him and, you know, falls in an array of bullets after he's managed to discharge his gun several times. So he really goes down, like, as the most, you know, manly figure uh, in her characterization. So she's, she's in this position of trying to get people like Robert Charles or other lynching victims into the kind of American heroic discourse that exists uh, for other people. And that's, you know, a really helpful challenge. And then, you know, Marcus Garvey, when he comes along, kind of does the same type of stuff. And it's, but it's very hard. Um, and if you look at the history of, you know, the cases that I look at in this book, almost all the major figures in the socialist left defense are white. Uh, even though there were, in fact, um, major lynchings that involved uh, and race riots that involved black uh, majority black labor unions, that the way that American politics and kind of national heroic uh, sort of culture and pop culture are are sort of set up, and the way the law itself functions uh, in this racial way, uh, you wind up with the kind of canon of white heroes at the same time that you have thousands of black people getting killed. Uh, with you know almost no record, so that's the kind of conflict that the, the book is examining, and that's why at the end when I get to the Black Panther Party, um, I reject pretty much all the negative commentaries that have been made about Black Panther Party defenses and say, look, these were the first. If you look the whole history of labor defense and, and anti-lynching activism. These were really the first major black-led organizations defending and creating for national popular consumption black heroes who were like serious militant revolutionaries. Huey Newton, Jackson, you know, these people were not portrayed as victims. They weren't um, seen as somebody that, you know, other people had to save in the same way. Uh, and they are, they are, it's not until, but it's pretty amazing, right, with the whole history that's going on for 100 years, it's not until the late 60s that you see that kind of um, black heroic uh, character. Um, and even, you know, people will say, what about the Scottsboro Boys and the Communist Party? But they were depicted as boys. Their mothers defended them. And they were actually in their 20s. They weren't really that young. Uh, you know, their sexual lives were not part of their defenses in the way that they were in um, other cases where Joe Hill is sort of like a sexy guy and you read about his longing to get married and stuff while he's in prison. You know, that, um, that, that's, you know, that's really the black feathers are kind of it. So I think it's interesting that they are so, and particularly their defense campaigns, are so widely uh, derided, critiqued, and that they're the object still for so much scorn. So that's kind of an overview of the whole big project. There's tons of other stuff in there, so.